today we are going to discuss the wonderful world of uh, FizzBuzz. And we're actually going to do a couple things. We're going to spend time looking through uh, the testing platform, the most commonly used testing platform for Ruby called RSpec. We'll talk a little bit about um, what is test-driven development, what is behavior-driven development, which lies at the core of what RSpec is all about. And we'll use that as a as the platform to delve into like the one of the most commonly um, approached challenges in uh, in code world, which is FizzBuzz. So we're gonna do a bunch of fun stuff. Uh, but first, we'll start by looking at uh, uh, test-driven development in general, and then we'll go from there. Sound good? Sounds good. Awesome. Ooh, just hey, Sam. Hey, good morning. How are you? Good. How are you? I am doing well. Thanks for asking. So, welcome to the world of RSpec and FizzBuzz. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> we're just getting started. So, we're going to um, we'll start by talking first of all about what test driven development is. Okay. If I could ask you what TDD is, what comes to mind when you first hear, hear, hear that term? Um, <laughs> are you throwing that to me or out in general? Out in general to both of you. Okay, that's great. Um, so test-driven uh, development, um, from what I understand of it, uh, with my small background in programming so far, right? Um, it's uh, pretty much we set the bar for what our pro program needs to do, then we cater uh, our program towards that. Rather than program to solve a problem, we actually program it to, to uh, to cater to what our test needs to do or what our program is supposed to do, if that makes sense. I think that makes a lot of sense. And that is such a perfect encapsulation right. of ultimately what test driven development is all about, which is uh, we break down our, our problem we we're looking to solve with our code, right. the smallest bits possible. And we build the expectation for what it's going to do first, mm -hmm. what it will look like, and then we code to meet those expectations. Correct. That's what TDD is all about. So the world before test-driven development was we would build something, mm -hmm. we would try and imagine all the ways in which it could go wrong on our own, right? Mm -hmm. All the different edge cases. They call them edge cases. All the things that like, what if a user uses it this way? Or what if a user does it this way? Or what if a user inputs this instead of that? Or what if a user's cat jumps on the keyboard mm -hmm. and, and destroys the program? Um, you know, all the different ways that it could go wrong. And we go, hey, let me like block production and see what happens. Right. With uh, TDD, test and development, you first think about what does this code What's the objective of this code? What is it meant to accomplish? What what the code going to be done? And let me build the code to meet those expectations. So let's actually um, let's take a critique at uh, the source. Dang it! A lot of feedback from one of you guys. <laughs> I don't know which one. I'm getting a lot of feedback also. Uh, uh, same here. Same here. I think it's just a connection in general because I'm in a quiet place yeah. right here. Let's, yeah. let's, um, oh, it's gone. So let, hopefully it'll stay gone. Um, so let's take a look at the source of all, uh, human knowledge, Wikipedia. <laughs> and take a look, right. And take a look at its little, uh, article here on test driven development. Okay. So it says that test driven development is a software development process that relies on the repetition of, of a very short development cycle. So the goal here, the key here is this, that relies on the repetition of a very short development cycle. Requirements are turned into very specific test cases. Then the software is improved to pass the, the new tests only. That is like, that is at its core succinctly what TDD is all, uh, all about. That we, uh, it's a repetitive process Mm -hmm. To continually iterate our code, to build our code, to meet small chunks of test requirements. Mm -hmm. And first we build the tests to, a co to, to say what we want it to do, what our code will eventually do when it's done, and then we build the code to meet that. Um, and then a subset of TDD is what we would call um, behavior-driven development. 
which again, from uh, the wonderful world of Wikipedia, uh, which gotta love Wikipedia, support Wikipedia, end of year giving, right? Um, Behavior-driven development um, is a software development process that emerged from test-driven development. And this uh, essentially, let's just write where I wanna look. Um, BDD is largely facilitated through the use of a simple domain-specific language using natural language constructs, like English-like sentences that can express the behavior and the expected outcomes. So what's really important here is that when we're building, um, my Amazon device has decided to start talking to me. I don't know why. I think it like maybe it heard something it sounded like uh, its keyword. It's like your cat. <laughs> it's like your cat. Amazon developers, be more specific around like what activates the devices if you're ever going to watch this. Um, <laughs> DDD is largely facilitated in the use of specific, simple domain specific language using natural language constructs like English like sentences. So basically, um, what's really cool about behavior driven development is that when you're building your test cases, you're using sentences. You're actually like writing it as, as, as how you would say it. Um, and that's uh, really just pretty awesome. And BDD focuses on where to start in the process, what to test and what not to test, how much to test in one go, what to call the test, and how to understand why a test um, fails. Uh, so why is this all important? Why are we talking about this? Because the number one testing platform for Ruby, for the whole Ruby language, is RSpec. In fact, every time you run Learn, when you finish a lab in Flatiron, Learn is built on top of RSpec. It's, it's adding some additional functionality to RSpec and, and um, wrapping it in another uh, keyword, Learn. Um, but also, you're running RSpec. And RSpec is behavior-driven development for Ruby. Making TDD productive <laughs> and fun. Woohoo! So, uh, yeah. I just I had a quick question, because you, you dropped so many jewels there. I think that was so special. <laughs> Um, so TDD and then you have behavior driven development is like a little brother of TDD. It's like a subset. Yeah. It's like, okay. it's like a little child. Little child. Gotcha. All right. And it, it, cause you have to think of it like in its evolution. So TDD came first and then BDD was a product of TDD. Gotcha. Gotcha. Awesome. Yeah. So, stuff. Yeah. so we're in this, in, in this time together, we're going to focus on trying to understand and read an R spec test. Okay. And it's not only helpful for um, our time together in this lab, mm -hmm. but it's going to be helpful for your entire curriculum in Ruby and Flatiron, mm -hmm. because all the tests are built for Ruby with our spec, mm -hmm. and it'll be helpful for you in life. Whenever, you're, whenever you become an awesome Ruby developer at a Fortune 500, and you are you know, building out your unit tests for your code, you know, you'll be able to think back to that day when, oh, I remember those Flatiron days, and I was doing all those R spec tests. I didn't do this so, yeah so our stuff is awesome um uh so this is like by the way this is just rspec.info would be the rspec website and yeah. they actually have some videos you can watch on their website which we're not going to watch them now together obviously but um if you wanted to on your own time to go check out the rspec website you can actually watch um you can watch this and you'll you'll notice if you follow developers on twitter and they'll often talk about you know, how happy they are when all their lights turn green. And what they're talking about is like when their RSpec tests or their tests in general pass, when they oh, yeah. they've accomplish their goals and yes. they all the green lights and like, woohoo, yeah. now we like can go and celebrate and, and uh, drink some margaritas. Uh, promised uh, land. Exactly. And I would <laughs> say that this would be the, the key sentence in this whole website here. Right. And maybe the key sentence in all of test driven development. Like entirely with an all test development, take very small steps. TDD is about breaking down your code to the smallest steps possible. And in fact, uh, you could say that modern programming is about breaking down the problem that you are attempting to solve into its smallest steps possible in general. That when you build your functions, you uh, as part of uh, the single responsibility principle of programming, you want each and every single function to do only one thing and not more than one thing. 
and you want to make that each function do the smallest thing it can do. And then you will bundle your functions together, bundle your class together, bundle your methods together in order to do one large thing. But each thing on its own, each part on its own is only doing one small thing. And you approach your problem, like let's say you're working at a company and the, and the business department gives you a, uh, a, a problem that needs to be solved around like customer workflow. And it's like a huge problem. Well, that can make your head explode, right? <laughs> Uh, but if you break it down and say, well, actually that huge problem is really like 30 different smaller problems. And those 30 different smaller problems, each one of those problems can be broken down to five, five steps. So let me work on those five steps. And let me finish that. Not only will it make your life more manageable, it'll probably make your code better. Um, so let's, let's take a look here. So um, in this lab, we're going to build methods that utilize flow control. We're going to read and understand test output, which is like so critical to develop a working program. And we're going to gain more familiarity with the concept of TDD. So maybe we've done a little bit of this, and we're going to do um, one and two together. Uh, so as we mentioned, when you run learn, every time you run learn in a lab, you're basically running our spec. And learn is uh, the Flatiron developers created the learn um, program, built uh, which built uh, which it houses within it our spec and it's added functionality within our spec so you could actually run our spec as well um, in your lab and and basically get the same results um, but there is some added functionality within um, learn which probably wants to make you keep keep to running learn um, as your tests when you're testing your your labs but you could theoretically run our spec as well and see something so if we just as an example, let's open up our ID, IDD, IDE for this. And if we ran our spec in the file, in the folder, look, it's exactly as if we ran um, learn, right? Because our spec is, learn is our spec, just with some added, some added functionality. I didn't know that. that that's so cool. Pretty cool, right? <laughs> right. Um, so we did a little bit of this. Uh, so the way in which we're going to talk about our spec and test your development today is going to be through uh, FizzBuzz. Have you ever heard of FizzBuzz, either of you? Yeah. Um, it's a small game that's supposed to print a Fizz, you know, give you three. Uh, I believe Buzz is about five. And if you get both, uh, you know, Fizz, you get FizzBuzz, I guess. Uh, I heard of it, but never really to you never really know. Did it. Right. Yeah. Huh? You've heard of it, but you never really did it. Right. Right. Yeah. And Charlotte, have you heard of it? Oh, yeah. I've done it. And what they do is a lot of times when you go for job interviews, they give you something similar to this to test you to see if you can do code. That is exactly right. This has become a really popular interview question. <laughs> wow. Question. Um, and so we're going to look at the FizzBuzz question together today. And the reason why it's so popular is because there's so many different ways that you can approach it. So many different ways you can do it. FizzBuzz is basically a, a problem that's asking you to, as a developer, to construct the right flow of your program. Uh, there's many different ways to flow this program through to accomplish the goal. Um, and so the you know, developer development team are testing or interviewing developing you know new candidates to join the, the team love this challenge because it lets them see you know your thought process lets them see like how you approach a problem and what is i mean ultimately like is a pretty easy challenge right it's not overly complex so it's something that can be solved within a relatively short period of time but it's got because it's got some different ways to solve it it lets them see how you think so it's a really popular way to approach job interviews and just as you said, Sam, the goal of FizzBuzz is to build a program that can take a number, and if the number is evenly divisible by three, it should return Fizz. If it's divisible by five, it should return Buzz. And if it's divisible by both three and five, it should return FizzBuzz. That, I mean, that's the program, right? It sounds, it sounds deceptively simple. Um, it actually is pretty simple, but how to solve it is, there's so many different ways to do it. So before we even get to solving it, let's think of it through the lens of a test-driven development developer as a TDD developer. Let's approach this not as 
um, pre-TDD person, but now we're in the world of TDD. So if we're gonna do that, before we even uh, commit one single word of code to the problem, what are we gonna do first? Think about what we want it to do. What mm -hmm. do we expect? Exactly. The first thing we're going to do is think about our expectations. We're going to think about what we want this to actually accomplish. Mm -hmm. So, and we can do that when, in English, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have to do that in Ruby. We can, or JavaScript, or Python, or Elixir, or any other language. We can do that just in English. Uh, we can just think. So we want to understand what it's going to do and how it will work when it works correctly. So uh, we expect FizzBuzz with a argument of three, and we give it a number of three to return fizz. We expect fizzbuzz with an argument of five to return buzz, and we expect fizzbuzz with an argument of 15 to return fizzbuzz. It's really, what's really important here is this language of expect. We expect, we expect, we expect. The expect word here is, um, it's, uh, it's, it's highlighting a word for you that's going to become more relevant in a minute because even though we're speaking in English and we're using English, the domain specific languages like uh, RSpec is, is constructed to use as much natural language as possible, but because it's ultimately a computer language, it's gotta have consistency. And so there's some natural language operators that uh, become the, the way in which you write test code. And one of those words is, um, is expect, right? We expect it. And what's great about that is, okay, you've got to remember to use the word expect when you're writing RSpec code, test code, but you would use the word expect anyways, most likely. Like, if you're writing this naturally, just in plain, you know, simple English, you would probably use, either you would use the word expect or you, you would use a synonym for the word expect, right? So it's not so far from how you would normally um, speak in general. And furthermore, we always want to provide a negative case. And by negative case, we also mean an edge case. We want to provide a case where it doesn't fit into the code itself. Because real world code, real, not real world code, real world implementation of code will always involve whether it's users or it's customers or it's clients or it's other colleagues are building internal facing code, doing things with your code that's not meant to be done. With. And you have to build in the functionality to address those to address those cases so if we if someone gives fizzbuzz four which would not be um divisible by by three or five we want to we wanted to return nil right we wanted to not break the program but we wanted to return something it could it return it could return nil it could return the number itself it could return a, a, a string statement saying like it looks like you're using a number that is not divisible by three or five. You want to try again? You know, something built into the program that makes it more um, resilient and flexible. Um, so at this point, we don't care how the method works. We're just stating our expectations, and we do that first. Um, and so by writing your test first and stating your expectations of your code, then you know your goal, right? And then you can build towards your goal. So let's talk about RSpec and what RSpec looks like. And uh, you can open up any Ruby lab in, in the Flatiron curriculum and find RSpec code and look at any of them. So here's just one example. So describe FizzBuzz. What do you think describe FizzBuzz does? It's showing that you've created uh, FizzBuzz, basically. And do you think this, the, this um, is a... Um, might be obvious based on how I asked the question. But do you think describe fizzbuzz and it returns fizz when the number is visible by three? These two lines, lines one and two, minus the do and the do, but the things that are in the quotation marks or the single uh, quotation mark, do you think that really matters? It doesn't matter, but if somebody else is looking at it, it does. That's right. So. It matters, it's, a, it's relative to what it means that something matters, right? Does it matter vis-a-vis -vis the execution of the test? No. Does it matter vis-a-vis -vis helping you in your thought process to code the test so that you can get to your goal? Yes. Does it matter when other developers are looking at your test and you're, let's say you're working on something collaboratively with others? 
or you're just, let's say, you know, five years down the road, you're at a different job because now you're the CTO of a firm and you're no longer the junior developer. And another junior developer comes into what was your old role and they look back and they're like, all I see is this. What is this? Oh, I see he, the person who was here before put this in here. That's great. Now I understand what they're trying to do. So it, it helps create um, a legacy for your code, right? That it can be understandable down the road. It's like, um, it's, uh, it's like creating like a instruction manual for your tests. Um, and also, so it's, it's doing two things. It's helping you in your thought process and it's helping your tests be more readable to others. Um, so describing FISBA. So we're gonna describe um, what we wanna do. And what will it do? It will, and look, we're not in this line here. It returns fizz when the number is fizz y three. We're not putting in here. It returns fizz the numbers of fizz y three. Returns buzz when it's fizz y five, and it returns fizz buzz when it's fizz y three and five. That whole long, long run-on sentence is not in here. The only thing this block of test code is doing, the only thing this is doing from lines one through seven is testing one piece of the problem. Not the whole problem, not two parts of the problem, just one piece of the problem. The one piece is it returns fizz when the number is divisible by three. Because remember, the part of TDD is to break down our problem into the smallest parts we can, right? So that's what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. So then on line three, we see fizz three is equal to fizz buzz with an argument of three. What's fizz three? We don't know what fizz three is yet, but whatever fizz three is, we'll get there in a minute, but whatever fizz three is, it's equal to an argument of fizz buzz. With an argument. We can understand this, fizz buzz with an argument of three, because that's telling us that we're gonna build a function called fizz buzz that's gonna take an argument of three, and whatever that is will be equal to fizz three. Fizz three will be equal to this. And then blank space, line five, here's that word expect, right? Expect right. fizz three, so here are the fizz three again, expect fizz three, dot two, and I love it, like dot two, like what is dot two? To do something, right? It, it's English. Dot two to EQ, and EQ being... It's equal. equal right? Equal. Right. Expect fizz three to equal fizz. So we're going to describe the top level what the function is going to do. We're going to break down it down to one part of the problem. We encapsulate what we want to run. And we'll talk about this line in a minute. And then at the end, we're going to create an expectation that whatever this is, is going to equal this um, string. It's going to return or equal or the value of the return will be this, this. So we got some key words here. Describe, it, expect, to, equal. Yeah, Sam? I just had a quick question. Uh, synth uh, synthetically, you see where it says uh, right on line two there? Yeah. Um, does it matter if it's a single quotation or double quotation? That's one of the things. I yeah, have. it's a good question. So when you want to put a quotation mark inside a quotation mark, because you see how it puts right quote marks you want to use single quote and then you can use a double quote inside it got it but not reversed yeah. but you can't reverse that can you um there's only one way to find out <laughs> yeah because i was looking at that for a little bit yesterday and i'm like um is it possible to you know let's let's find out so you want to reverse it, right? Right. Let's see if that's possible. See what happens? Okay. No. It left the single quotations around Sam. We want the single quotations, right? Mm -hmm. So it seems like it works. And if we would do the opposite, It does the double quotations. Right, so it does preserve our quotation marks either way. Okay. I love answering these questions by actually just doing it. 
I do too. I love when you do that, Ben. Right. <laughs> it's totally, totally a fan, man, because uh, it, it clears it up. Yeah, yeah. it's just like, in, in a totally another world of mine, when I was a student, it's in a totally different context, totally different profession. I used to have an instructor when I was in the graduate program, and he, and every time someone asked him a question, he'd be like, I don't know, let's find out. And, I'm like, <laughs> and it, it wouldn't be code, but it'd be like a philosophical question, right? So it'd be right. like, like he's like, let's let's walk through that philosophical question, and like let's carry the conversation, and see what happens. Like, don't trust me. Like, what do what do I know? Like, <laughs> let's see what happens. And I always like, I always just love that approach because it's like, you know, tr- verify first. You know, <laughs> like, right? Like, we both learn together, and yeah, he helps a lot. Yeah, a whole lot. Like, why believe me? Believe the code. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so we got a few key words here. We already talked about expect. Describe and it are, are, are ways to preface what your descriptive strings for test code. Describe and it allow you, so describe is the top level preface, prefatory keyword for um, a top level descriptor of what your code is going to do. And it is how you start breaking down the blocks of the problems. With a pre- it's the prefatory keyword for a string. Mm-hmm. And expect, we can now kind of get what expect does, right? Expect mm-hmm. is what we want the final solution to produce. And two, again, is kind of self-explanatory. And equal, I would say, is also probably self-explanatory. But let's just take a look here, um, what they say here. Um, the first thing RSpec allows you to do with its domain-specific language is to define what it is you are describing. As in, are you writing a test that describes how our billing system works, or are you writing a test that describes how FizzBuzz works? Right. So, describe just lets you describe very quickly. Like, so you could write here. Um, uh, I don't know. In a uh, chat, a chat bot. I mean, obviously, it's not going to work here because IRB doesn't have our spec. But you could write, describe this as a chat bot, and that would just be like giving you a high level description of what your code is like. The one liner, like, what is it? What is this program? It's a chat bot. It's FizzBuzz. It's a billing system. It's uh, mm-hmm. it's uh, you know whatever. Um, our spec gives us the describe method. The argument we did pass the describe method is arbitrary. It doesn't really do anything, right? We talked about that. Besides document what exactly it is we're testing. Since we're writing a specification, also known as a test, for FizzBuzz, it makes sense to pass describe the string FizzBuzz. It's just arbitrary. It just allows us to remember what we're doing and to help us like, um, hone in on our thought process. Um, describe also accepts a block, which will be covered shortly, but for now, just know that a block in Ruby starts with do. And do we know what a block is when we say a block? A block of code. And what does that mean? Uh, pretty much. Um, so what, what the way our program needs to act, or well, in this case, because we're testing, it would be uh, whatever you code in another file need to align with, uh, with you know, what is in this R spec when we test it. And yeah, I would, say that's, I would say that's pretty much right. You could probably say it even more succinctly that a block of code is just one, is, is a complete paragraph. That tests one thing. Right, or a block of non-test code, like any, any code, either test code or actual code, is just uh, like if a, uh, um, like uh, in JavaScript, like you would, you know, use a semicolon to say you're done with a sentence if you're making a comparison to English, right? So the way a period or a question mark or an exclamation point is how you end a sentence. In JavaScript, you would end a sentence with a semicolon, right? Mm -hmm. It's a complete, one complete line of thought. And a block of code is is the finishing of a paragraph. Like it's one statement of thought. It's, and so in test code, it's one test, right? And in, um, I don't know what this is, but it looks cool. <laughs> it's one test, and in, uh, um, and in your regular code, it's like one thing. It also, a block, when you have code, regular code, um, 
what is in that block determines what happens basically. So you can change out what's in that block to change what's going on. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And this is all like all these things are giving tools to developers to help them um, structure their headspace better um, mm -hmm. and structure your brain so that you can accomplish the right. task that you need to accomplish and the problems you need to work at. Because I mean, does, does a computer care about a blo like blocks and do's and and ends of paragraphs and sentences as computers care about those things? Not really. In fact, when your code gets compiled, when it gets executed, it just gets into one long string for the program. That's all it is, one huge long string. It doesn't really think that way. It doesn't really think in the ways that we think. But in order for us to write it and to do it well, we need to have structure um, and right. break things down into component parts. Uh, so that's described. And look at this. What is a block? Okay. So a block is a simple unit of code that starts with the do keyword, ends with the end keyword. That's all it is. It, the word it, is actually describing the desired functionality. Every specification in RSpec begins with the it method, right? So it's describing the functionality. So here, again, it's arbitrary, but it returns fizz, the number is visible by three, right? And it always, it's a good idea to always use a verb or an action in your it block, in your it, um, in your it descriptor. So it returns, it prints, it emails, it validates. So you're going from describe, which is pretty much, you know, the thing we're testing, and it breaks it down to one more layer of specificity by starting to use action verbs. Um, yeah. So is it safe to say, just from the example you gave, um, you know, describe it, um, those kind of, they're like methods built into Ruby already. Exactly. Okay. R spec already. Uh, R spec, pardon me. Yeah. Okay. Thank and you. Then, um, yeah, no worries. And then expect to and equal do exactly what we just said. Um, so phys three, which we said we would get back to in a minute, in this example, phys three is basically, a, a, in this fictional example is a fictional variable called that we assign the value of what we get back when we run fizzbuzz with an argument of three. We assign that fit in this fictional example to this variable called phys three. So that's all the phys three is here in the code. Phys three is a variable that we created to hold the value of fizzbuzz with an argument of three. And so we're saying that the value of this variable will equal the, the value of this program when it's run with an argument of three. That's all, it's, that's all it's saying. So let's actually now do it. Let's open up our IDE. Let's take a look and let's look at our test suite here. So it says fizzbuzz returns fizz and numbers divisible by three. Undefined method fizzbuzz, which tells us what? We need to create a method for fizzbuzz. Yeah, so let's do that. Wrong number of arguments given. What does that usually tell us? Well, um, it says expected zero given one. It what needs if, an argument. Needs an argument. <laughs> so why don't we give it an argument of, uh, of a number? Let's we'll say integer, but let's say a number. And actually, let's take a quick second and look at the spec file. See, this is basically exactly what we walked through. So first of all, the, these variables are being held in this file, fizzbuzz. Uh, uh, maybe spec helper. Where are they? Let's not worry about that for a second, but uh, for the sake of time. But so fizzbuzz three will equal the execution of the code of fizzbuzz and argument of three. Fizzbuzz five, fizz five equals the execution of the code of five. Fizz 15, fizz 15, et cetera. So let's go back to our code here. So now we've given it an argument. Expected fizz got nil. Because expected fizz three to equal fizz. So what's our problem here? 
Expect for students to equal fizz. Um, we didn't we didn't show that yet. We need to write empty method, right? Right. So how would we do that? If um, so we say something such as um, if fizz uh, is ah, number. Yeah, I have it in my head. Yeah. If 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 number is divisible by three, it would give uh, that would give us fizz. If, if and how do we do that with a module operator? Say it again. I didn't hear you. How do we find out? So this is how we do it. So if the number mm -hmm. we pass in is divisible by three and has a remainder of zero, mm -hmm. that means that it was divisible by three, right? Correct. So if that's true, then what should it print for us? Fizz. Cool. Awesome, guys. So now we got to do buzz. So what do we do there? Yeah. Else if. Yeah. Did that work? Yeah. That works. We we need one more though. <laughs> else. <laughs> okay. Else what? If uh, number is not divisible, this is where we put the null in. No, well, no. no but this we still is got fifteen. Yeah. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Fifteen. So else if uh, number. And right, divisible by fifteen. didn't like that right yeah and i found that the order you put these in matters this is why this challenge is used on interviews also maybe we want to make these two distinct things and remember not arithmetic functions that are put in parentheses are treated as as distinct and uh and now you're saying i want to see if this number is is both divisible by three and by five. Whereas when you don't put in parentheses, it might not be as explicit. So maybe we can try that. Nope. So let's think about the flow of our program then. Maybe we need to change the flow of our program. It's yeah, you want the the else if last one, the three and the five to go first. That way it's not stopping sooner that's exactly right you have it exactly right because i did the same thing in this lab i was like why is it not working <laughs> <laughs> So we have a syntax error. Expect a keyword then, expect a keyword then or, and the number three. Oh, because I kept that up there. That's why. <laughs> and we passed our tests because two things are important here. One is making sure that your arithmetic functions are uh, put in the right order of priority and parentheses gives each one its own distinct unit. And the second thing is the flow of the code. That if, it, if this is not up here first, then it'll stop here because the number is divisible by five and it is also divisible by three, but we want to check first if it is divisible by three and five. And because that is, a, you know, you're looking for two things. So you want to first check for the two things and move down the less specific one thing and one thing. 
So I hope this was helpful. Was this helpful, guys? Yes. Yeah, awesome. and I actually did mine a little different, so I like seeing it done a different way. This, that, and that's the thing, there's so many ways to do this, like so many ways. Um, I think um, that basically wraps it up. Thank you guys so much. Oh, wow, that's it? Oh, come on, you can't be that easy. You can come back at nine o'clock for round two of this. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, cool. <laughs> you we were having way too much fun. I'm like, oh, come on. Thank you, Ben. My pleasure. Hey. Hey. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate it so much. It's so nice to learn both of you. I'll yes. see you tomorrow morning, Ben. I'll see you tomorrow morning. <laughs> see you. Keep on the streak of learning. <laughs> Absolutely. Have a good one, sir. Be well, guys. See you, Charlie.